Okay, going on to some geographic information in the 70s and 80s, we're going to see a huge shift in demographics of people moving from where we have most people living in the beginning to be in the Northeast, and we're going to have quite a few people in the Midwest. And we're going to see this huge shift down into the South and Southwest. So why are we seeing this huge shift of people moving to the Southwest and the South? Well, part of it's going to be technological developments that contributed to this shift. So um, before tech innovations, they felt like it was too hot in the South to live there, and it was too dry in the West. And I think for most of us, since we live in Texas and we know what it's like in August, we could probably agree with this assumption. So before certain technologies, such as uh, the government building dams to make water available to Western cities, um, the... Rise in oil prices is factors that are going to lead to moving west. So our factors leading are going to be um, inventions, and some of these inventions and innovations are going to be um, dams, one that we all love, air conditioning and making it more readily available. Also, you're going to have a rise in oil prices, you know, with the oil embargo in OPEC. So since you have a rise in oil prices and people use oil and gas to heat their homes, well, it got too expensive in the winter when you have to use oil and gas all the time. So they want to go somewhere where maybe they don't have to use as much of that. Um, we're going to have the AC air conditioning is probably going to be one of the biggest factors that's going to lead to people being able to move to the south and southwest and still live there comfortably all year round. So after all of this happens, after this, um, after these factors that are mentioned above, you're going to have a huge population boom. And we can tell from our map. Um, you look at the green states. This is going to be a percent change in population. And this map's a little later. If you looked at one starting in the 19, like 1970 to 2000, then you've got some states that have doubled their population during that time. And most of them are going to be in the south-southwest. And so we have a huge population boom, which can be a plus, can be a minus, depends on how you look at it. And then we also start seeing some other environmental issues such as scarcity of water and also um, a burden on the environment because we're trying to live in an environment and change the environment a little bit to meet our needs. So this is going to be something that's a geographic phenomenon that's happening during this time. Social ideas are going to start becoming more conservative in the 1970s and we're going to have this major conservative resurgence. So we're going to have some people that are contributing to this. One's going to be Phyllis Schlafly. Um, she is going to be kind of your anti-feminist. She's against the Equal Rights Amendment and she wants to, she felt like the Equal Rights Amendment would reduce women's protection and, um, and their role with the family unit. Uh, also we have Billy Graham. He's a very famous minister. Um, he is going to be an advisor to presidents spiritual advisor. He's also um, very anti-communist. He's also against segregation. He is actually, whenever one of the times Martin Luther King Jr. in the late 1950s got arrested, uh, it was Billy Graham that went and posted his bail. So a little interesting trivia for you. Somebody else is going to be important, and this is he's kind of one of the beginning um, leaders with the conservative resurgence, and that's going to be Barry Goldwater. He's going to run for office in 1964. And he's going to help revive conservatism at the time. And uh, he's going to call for a, a tough stance on dealing with Soviets. Um, he's also going to have a goal of preserving freedom and, less, and wanting less reach of the government. And the idea of not having the government involved so much in our economy and in our personal lives is going to be a huge theme of conservatives. Somebody else that's going to be um, a contributor to this conservative resurgence is going to be Sandra Day O'Connor. She is the first female Supreme Court justice. And she is a conservative. And she actually later on is going to be kind of a swing vote between liberals and conservatives. But she becomes a justice in the early 1980s. Now, some larger groups that are going to contribute to this rise of conservatism. We have the Heritage Foundation, and they're going to promote conservative ideas. Um, they're going to be an example of nonprofit lobbying, and they're going to attempt to influence legislators on various bills. We are also, and they're going to be a big supporter of 
um, they're going to endorse Reagan and be a big supporter of Reagan, as is the National Rifle Association and the major Moral Majority. All three of these are going to be um, big endorsers of Reagan. The National Rifle Association, we've, you've probably heard it in the news, especially with issues with gun rights. Um, originally, they were just part of promoting rifle shooting and marksmanship. They weren't really political until after they passed a gun control act after a number of assa political assassinations in the late 1960s. So then they started to become more political. Um, again, they're tending to be politically conservative. In 1980, they endorsed Reagan, and that's the first time in history that the NRA supported a presidential candidate. So you're going to probably see them mostly associated with gun rights. The more moral majority, this is going to be your Christian conservative group, and they're going to favor strict interpretation of the Bible. They're very anti-communist. They're socially conservative. Um, they opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. They uh, held rallies. They tried to help get Reagan elected as president. Um, they are dissolved in 1989 when their leader, Jerry Falwell, says that their mission was accomplished with bringing back um, more conservative values. A group in the 1990s is going to be founded by Newt Gingrich, and that's the Contract with America, and his goal was to restore the balance between government and its citizens. And Newt Gingrich, he, um, he writes kind of a book-length contract, and it's endorsed by most Republicans, and he agrees that the federal government's too large, and then they're no longer responsive to the people that they serve. He felt like the uh, they wanted to restore this balance between the government and its citizens, and it was a promise by Republican candidates to the American people that they would um, listen to their concerns more and try to be more reflective of the needs of the American people. So that was the contract with America. So let's look at how this era might be assessed. So let's look at our first question. The policy objectives of Reaganomics were based on the theory that. So I want to look at my question or my stem and see if there's any key words I need to know. Um, well, Reaganomics is one that's major. We know this had to do with um, lower taxes, um, increased military spending, and we know this was an economic an economic um, system. So did it, was it based on the theory that A, borrowing from foreign countries would help cover the cost of domestic programs, B, significant increases in government spending would help reduce unemployment, C, broad tax cuts and financial deregulation would promote economic expansion, D, reducing trade barriers would result in a budget, D, reducing trade barriers result in a budget surplus. Um, well, A, borrowing from foreign countries will help cover cost of domestic programs. We don't ever talk about trying to get foreign countries to help us with domestic programs under Reagan. So that's incorrect. Um, increases in government spending would help reduce unemployment. Uh, we didn't connect these two together. It was more about taxes and reducing taxes. Um, there were tax cuts. and There was financial deregulation. And he felt like this would help with expanding the government. So let's keep that one in mind. D, reducing trade barriers result in a budget surplus and he doesn't really tackle trade in Reaganomics so we're going to cut that one out correct answer is C next example in 1979 the Shah of Iran was forced into exile the US government later allowed the Shah to enter the United States for medical treatment this perceived US support for the Shah of Iran resulted in which of the following so this is that issue of Shah of Iran he was allowed to enter the United States and we know that this led, what did this lead to? So I want to think about this before looking at my answer choices. Well, I know this led to protest and this led to storming the Iranian, the U.S. Embassy. And then that led to the hostages, hostage crisis. Okay. So I thought this through. Now let's look at my answer choices. A, Iran attacked a U.S. military base in Asia. Um, Iran did not go to Asia and attack a U.S. military base there. B, Soviet forces began an occupation of Iran. Soviets did not try to get involved with Iran. We didn't talk about this. Remember, if we haven't talked about it, it's probably not the right answer. Israel demanded U.S. support for strategic bombing of cities in Iran. Again, this did not happen during this time. They're talking about what did the what resulted as a result of us helping support supporting the Shah of Iran. The revolutionaries kidnapped a group of U.S. citizens in Iran. Yes, they kidnapped them, and they made them hostages. So our correct answer is D. Uh, 